Hello, heroes and hedonists. My name is TV Skyn, and here's a video people have been asking for a lot. What is the deal with Ilawi? Now, Ilawi is an interesting character design on many fronts, not the least of which that she just might be the only genuinely religious champion in the game. Now, in a game where the gods literally just walk amongst mortals and where you have multiple characters who are embodiments of various kinds of divine power, that's a slightly strange thing to say that she's the only genuinely religious character. But let me explain. Ilawi is the only character in League of Legends whose entire character, whose character design, whose story, whose person, <clears throat> whose personal traits are all about being religious. They are about being the herald of Nagakebras, about being the leader of that particular organized religion, about being a priestess, about being a prophet, about living her life according to the ways of Nagakebras, according to the tenets of her faith, which is something that no other character in the League really has. Even characters like Diana, whose backstory has very much, I think very much has religious elements to it, that she is the only one who chooses to worship the moon, and she's out on a quest for revenge against the sun worshippers who denied her faith, who denied her equal access and to, who tried to destroy her as a heretic. And the similar thing with Leona, who is the embodiment of the aspect of the sun, who's very much part of a group of sun worshippers. But neither of those two characters are primarily about being religious, about living up to some kind of set of religious ideals associated with their chosen gods. They're really not. Diana's story isn't about waking up in the morning, doing the moon prayer, and setting up for the moon ritual with the, you know, correct thing, and, and, you know, reciting from the Book of Moon commandments and doing the moon things that moon worshippers must do. Her story is about, I'm gonna kill these motherfuckers for not letting me believe in the moon. Similarly with Leona, her lore state is a little bit complicated right now, but right now, her story is about, as part of being an embodiment of the aspect of the sun, she needs to contact Diana, who is the aspect of the moon, because of some Targon-related reasons that were never really expanded upon. Her mission is about finding Diana, about living up to her role and her responsibility as an aspect of the sun, but it's not really about religious worship. It's not really about being part of a certain religious way of life. The closest we really get is a character like Carthus, who has a strong religious devotional belief in death and in taking people out of life and into eternal, unchanging, blissful undeath, at least such as he sees it. But the trouble with calling him religious is that he's literally the only person in the entire world who believes what he does, and the way in which he practices his religion is just by murdering people a lot and turning them into undead wraiths under his command, which makes him mostly indistinguishable from a character like Jin, who also has very strong personal beliefs about why he has to kill everybody, but that's not quite the same as being religious or being part of a religion. Ilawi, by contrast, is not only religious, she embodies her religion. Everything about her character design, everything about her personality, everything about her voice lines, and everything about you know, how she's portrayed in the stories is about her role as a priestess, as a leader of the cult of Nagakebros, or rather not the cult, really, because it is an established institutional religion. She is the head priestess of this organized religion that exists in the Serpent Isles. So. Let's take a look at her bio, let's take a look at her color story, talk a little bit about those, and then talk some about her very interesting character design. Now, Ilawi's biography is mostly not really about Ilawi, or it is, except in a roundabout way. Most of Elawa's bio is taken up with descriptions of the faith of Nagakebros and the god itself and what the god commands that people should do and what kinds of religious belief Elawi follows. It's not really about, you know, Elawi was five years old when she first encountered blah 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 and her fair father and her parents and her sister and something something happened. There's really very little in terms of personal details about Elawi, about her life, about her thinking, about her personality, about about what she wants, about what she does. There's just like you get all who encounter Elawi are struck by her presence. An intense woman, the priestess is fully committed to the experience of living. She takes what she wants, destroys what she hates and revels in everything she loves. And then just religion, 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 more religion, religion, and then rumors persist that Bilgewater's most bloodthirsty and infamous pirate had his heart broken by the towering priestess, i.e. her and Gangplank used to fuck. Like that, that's, I'm not, e I'm not even doing that for a joke, that's literally what used to happen between them. They used to be a couple, and Ilawi used to be in love with him, 
isn't anymore, but there's some feelings there. We're going to talk about those later. But like I said, most of this is dedicated to the cult of Nakakebros or the religion of Nakakebros, what it's about, what it wants people to do, how you're supposed to live according to this creed. And then we get secondhand information about Ilawi that she lives up to all of this stuff. That's part of her, how she lives, but it's not really directly about her. So central to the religion's theology are three tenets. Every spirit was born to serve the universe. Desire was built into every living being by the universe. The universe only moves towards its destiny when living creatures chase their desires. So the cult of Nagakebros is essentially a rather hedonistic religion. And um, Nagakebros really just wants you to pursue your desire, pursue your ambition fully. That is to say, if your ambition, if, if your mission in life, if the thing you want more than anything else is to collect all the Pokemon in all the Pokemon games, and you want to, you know, level them with perfect IVs and breed them and have a full roster and just build the perfect competitive roster, if that's the thing you want more than anything else, if that's what you're pursuing with every fiber of your being, if that's the cause towards which you are bending every ounce of your energy, then theoretically, according to the information we have, Naga Keberos would approve of you. Because it's not really about what kind of desire you chase. It's not about what kind of ambition you're trying to live up to. It's about how much of yourself you're putting into living up to that ambition. It's about how how much energy you're expending, how much you are driven by your desires. On the other hand, if you just kind of want to have an education and get a job, whatever job, who cares and who gives a shit, doesn't really matter. If you want to just, you know, take home a paycheck and, you know, maybe have a nice apartment and maybe have a family one day and maybe grow old and maybe get a pension, maybe go on some vacations at some point and then die eventually. Naga Kebros would be somewhat less enthusiastic about you because you're just doing what society expects of you. You're not really pursuing your own unique special destiny, your own desire, your own ambition. You're just kind of going with the flow and not really moving on your own. At least insofar as the information that we have, it's possible that there's more to the theology that hasn't been revealed yet. But as far as I can tell, the general principle is that, like, chase your ambition and your desire with all your energy and you are good in the eyes of Nagakebros. And so Ilawi's duty as a truth bearer of Nagakebros is to, first of all, um, just, you know, deal with the day-to-day -day business of running a religion. That is, she is the head priestess, she does, she deals with, you know, questions of theology and stuff, but more specifically, um, is to spearhead the war against undeath. Undeath is an abomination to Nagakeboros. Nagakeboros do not, does not like it. If you die, you're supposed to move on. Like, you're supposed to keep moving on in the circle of life, whatever the hell that may be. You're not supposed to be like, no, I'm just gonna be dead forever. I'm just, I'm just, I'm just gonna stop here where I'm dead and be the same forever stuck in one place for all time. So one of Ilawi's primary jobs is to turn back the harrowing, to destroy the undead, to fight the black mists from the Shadow Isles when they come and destroy the undead. Secondly, her job is to test people with the test of Nagakebros, with to test them in the eyes of her god, to put them through a great trial, and if they survive, then, you know, help them pursue their ideals. Her job is essentially to make sure that people are pursuing their ambitions with the full force of their personal power and not just wallowing where they are or just doing the thing that they've always been doing. And as part of that mission, Ilawi has decided to come to Bilgewater, which is a place that traditionally was not really considered a useful place for Nagakebros to be. The religion of Nagakebros had avoided Bilgewater because it's full of people who aren't really inclined to commit themselves to a religion like that, who don't really move within the same kind of cultural behavior that the rest of the people of the Serpent Isles do. And by the way, the Serpent Isles, where Bilgewater lies, is a major region that's not just about Bilgewater. Bilgewater is one city, one important city in the Serpent Isles, but the Serpent Isles themselves <clears throat> have tribes, they have religions, they have cultures, they have all kinds of stuff going on outside of just Bilgewater. And so Bilgewater has been this kind of little island of co continental culture that has been mostly left alone, but Ilawi has decided to give Bilgewater her protection from the harrowing, because that's part of her duty, and to spread her religion in that particular city, for which she is drawing some criticism from her fellow priests. 
Leading us on to her color story, The Burden, which is a color story about which I have some mixed feelings, I have to say, because this color story isn't really about Ilawi. Not really. It's about gangplank. What happens in the story is that Ilawi is fielding the usual complaints from her, you know, religious cohorts that Bilgewater is a terrible place, we shouldn't be here, this is a waste of time, these people cannot be turned to anything useful. But Ilawi's like, no, we're gonna stay here because I say so, and this is this is <clears throat> this is what I've decided. And then her people drag in Gangplank, who has just been um, usurped by misfortune. Like this is the immediate aftermath of when Gangplank's ship is blown up and he loses his arm and he's left for dead in the water, and misfortune takes over control over much of Bilgewater. He's dragged in, so like with his arm missing, just completely wounded, terribly broken barely alive, and Ilawi decides to put him through the test of Nagakebarus, which means she rips his soul out of his body and then beats his soul senseless with tentacles, because that's how Nagakebarus do. He passes the test and Ilawi decides to aid him in trying to take back control over Bilgewater, because he is good in the eyes of Nagakebarus. He has the drive, he has the ambition, he has the personal power to pursue his desire. Most of this story is about how Gangplank gets back on his feet after having his ass kicked by misfortune in the rebellion. And most of the story is really about <clears throat> getting Gangplank from being completely beaten and completely destroyed to becoming the current version of Gangplank with the mechanical arm and the revenge complex against misfortune and that whole thing after his rework. It's not so much about Elawi. It's really not about her relationship to her religion so much as it is about how Gangplank picks himself up. We do get a little stuff. As a girl, she had been self-conscious about it, about being very tall and large, always feeling like she was stumbling into people, but she had learned, when I move, they should know enough to get out of my way. And we get a little, a tiny bit of insight into some of the doubts that sometimes linger in her. She has feelings for Gangplank still, not powerful feelings, and she's not really interested in continuing the relationship, but she had loved him once, once upon a time. And now, as, she's, as he stands before her, and she needs to test him, despite the fact that he's, you know, barely alive, she considers going easy on him, considers not testing him, considers just kind of letting him go, because she still has some remaining feelings for him. But then, like, that that doubt is kind of it it's kind of there for a second and then she kind of dismisses it because what fool would choose a man over a god and does what Nagakebros asks of her tests him he passes and she's reaffirmed in her faith i would have kind of preferred that this be part of the general lore event of bilgewater instead of being elawi's color story because what i want is to know how does Ilawi relate to her religion? Like, what is it that drives her so strongly towards Nakakebros? What is it that gives her this unwavering faith in her god? What is what, what was her road to Damascus moment? Like, what was her moment of religious revelation where she realized the truth of Nakakebros? Or was she just raised in the religion? Like, that's another possibility. Maybe she didn't have one of those. Maybe there was no grand moment when she realized everything. Maybe she was just raised to believe in the teachings of Nagakebros, and that has always been what she believed more than anything. Whatever the case may be, I, whichever one you choose, there are interesting possibilities for storytelling there. If Ilawi has always been raised in the faith of Nakakebros and has never considered any other faith, then there are some interesting stories to be had in confronting her with different methods of thinking, different ways of seeing the world, different ways of considering things, and seeing how she reacts against it. Maybe giving her a religious crisis, like one where she's genuinely confronted with something that challenges her beliefs, that forces her to consider an alternate perspective, and then she finds out why she believes so strongly in Nagakebarus, and she comes back to have her faith reaffirmed by the ordeal. But nonetheless, there's an interesting story there. On the other hand, if she is, if she does have, ha, ha, if she has already had that road to Damascus moment, that moment of revelation where she becomes certain in her knowledge of Nagakebarus, then it's more interesting to bounce other characters off that. Like, what happens when a character like Garen runs into Ilawi. Garen, a character who very strongly believes in an ideal, but who also has a family obligation that tests his dedication to that ideal, i.e. his sister is a mage, he is actually obliged to either exile or kill her. 
How does he react to that? He is a kind of character who's ripe for a testing. How does Ilawi relate to characters from Noxus? How does she relate to Yordles? Like, where are the Yordles' place in the cycle of Nagakebras, in the faith of Nagakebras? How does she relate to other kinds of creatures, like Orn, who is a god, or Kindred, or stuff like that? There are good stories to be told there, and so having her color story just kind of be her kicking Gangplank's ass to get him back on his feet, it's a little... Eh. It doesn't tell us much about her, it just tells us something about him. A little disappointing. Anyway, that's enough about her lore. Let's talk about her character design. Now, the first thing you notice about Alawi is that she's built like a brick shit house. Like, she is huge! She's got muscles for days! She could crush multiple things between her hands. Like, she's a big lady who can punch people to death. So why is that? Like, why is that her character design, why is that important for her? Well, because it helps her embody the faith of Naga Kebros, and it helps her embody the faith that she has chosen. Like, if you remember, Ilawi's role within this religion is to be someone who tests other people, who is to make herself an obstacle that they must overcome in order to move on within the cycle of Naga Kebros universe, like within the, that cycle of life that is envisioned by her god, she must stand in their path and say, if you want to move on, you've got to get past me first. Let me see what you've got. Therefore, she needs to be physically imposing. She needs to look dangerous. She needs to look like if you come at her, you might get hurt. Like if you try to deal with her, if you try to get past her, if you try to to punch her, you're gonna break your hand. She needs to look powerful, intimidating, and physically imposing. And that creates a problem. Because, as the case happens to be with character design, being muscular, being large, being physically powerful are qualities that are generally associated with masculinity. It's kind of dumb, but that's the way, unfortunately, as the as it is right now, that's the way it is. When a character is big, physically strong, powerful, we tend to think of them as manly or mannish. We tend to think of them as unfeminine. So if you're a character designer and you want to design a character who is a woman, who is obviously a woman, whose gender presentation is feminine, but you also need her to be big, buff, built like a shit brick, uh, brick shit house, capable of pounding people into the dirt, how do you square that particular circle? Well. If you look to um, reality, there is a dichotomy between how we portray power and what power actually looks like. This is an explainer by an artist called Sila Squid. I'm going to have a link to their Twitter down in the description. You should go follow them because they do really great art. But one of the things that she explains is that our visual ideal of power tends to be based around this kind of thing, which is a bodybuilder ideal. This is this is what your Mr. Universe contestant looks like. And this tends to be the blueprint from which we create our fantasy heroes, especially. This is your Conan the Barbarians, your Doomfists in Overwatch, and indeed Reinhardt uh, from Overwatch is also designed around this general design principle with these like very highly defined, sort of big, bulgy muscles it's just all over the place, and this very triangular-shaped torso with a hell of a lot going on. But the thing is, this is a bodybuilder body type, which is not actually built for strength. It's built for muscle definition. It's a very particular type of body sculpting that we have adopted as a visual shorthand for power. But in reality, if you look at people who compete in strongman contests, who do weightlifting and powerlifting, what you find is a body type that's much more along these lines, which is a body type that has a lot of, you know, powerful core muscles that protect the spine and the internal organs and who aren't really concerned with big bulging muscles so much as they're concerned with very densely packed muscles. They also tend to have a lot more body fat going on than your Mr. Universe types who actually starve themselves um, before a show in order to properly define, like, to make their muscles look even more defined. And you can see this if you look at real-life athletes. If you look at MMA fighters, for example, or you look at someone like a javelin thrower at the Olympics, or you look at someone like a hammer thrower um, at the Olympics, these are people whose bodies are built for physical exertion, who are built for strength, who are built for endurance and power. And what you get there is not a lot of that most classic feminine identifier, which is the hourglass shape. If you think of a character like Miss Fortune, she is all about that hourglass. She's all about that thin waist and those wide hips and those like luscious bosom going on, which is the classical symbol of 
femininity and womanhood when it comes to character design. Like, even more than just breasts themselves, even more than long hair and makeup and stuff, the character design shorthand for feminine, for female, is that hourglass body type. So the circle you have to square when you design a character like Ilawi is how do we make her look like a brick shit house, look dangerous, physically imposing, but we also imply that visual signifier? Again, League of Legends is not really a game that's particularly concerned with subtlety when it comes to its character designs. It kind of can't be because the character design has to be on display in the game. This isn't Mass Effect. This is not a game where you have a lot of time talking to the character and exploring their feelings and dealing with subtleties. It's not a Disney movie where there's an overarching narrative, where there's an emotional arc and stuff going through. What you see of the characters tends to happen in the game, so as much of the characters have to be clearly on display in a visual manner as possible. There really isn't time to do deep dive subtle explorations of the nuances of what a character might look like. It has to be on display on the model. Well, the designers at Riot came up with a couple of different clever solutions. First of all, a little trick of color. You see Alawi's breastplate here. It is made of a sort of bright teal material of some kind. It's not even clear if it's really metal or whatever the case may be, but what it is is a much brighter color than the dark robes that she's wearing underneath. This is even more obvious in her, um, in her character model, which I have brightened a little bit here. And what happens is the eye fixates on the bright shape that is most obvious, and that sort of becomes the guide for how we perceive her body shape to be. And because the chest plate here is very much about heightening that narrow waist and broad bosom, it makes her look more feminine. It makes her look more womanly. It kind of emphasizes the idea of feminine curves on her body, even though her actual body, as we can indeed see from her character design, is really not so curvy. It's really not such a narrow waist that's going on with her, but the chest plate very effectively implies that shape and helps us identify her, therefore, as having an hourglass shape from an impressionable perspective, even if if it's not quite as present as you might think. And it's something similar that they're doing with these um, cloth things that she's wearing around her hips. The function of those is to widen her hips, is to widen the shape that happens immediately after her midriff to give her more of that hourglass shape without necessarily compromising the fact that at her core, she needs to have a strong man body. She can't really have a, a, a wasp, uh, a wasp-like waist. She can't really be waifish. She has to have a strong man body. So they're using the costume on top of the character to highlight a, an hourglass shape that isn't necessarily really there. Having said all that, there is a substantial difference between how Elawi looks in her splash art and how she actually looks in game, because in game, her waist is a little narrow. It is, I, I have to say, like, when I compare the thickness of her upper arm to the thickness of her waist here, and then I look at how that comparison would fare in game, I feel like they've narrowed her waist a little bit too much. And again, this might be an issue of game readability, i.e. in order to make it visually apparent that Ilawi is feminine, the character modelers might have given her a bit more of an hourglass shape than the character design in the splash art really calls for in order to make sure that this is more obvious to the player when you're playing. Maybe, or maybe there was some miscommunication between the modeler and the people who were doing, you know, the concept art and the splash art. I don't know, whatever the case may be, I like the way she's presented in the splash art more than I do with her character model, because her character model is a little bit, to me, disproportionate. Like, she's got these very, very, very thick arms, and then this waist that's just kind of a little bit too small to support them, and then this very, very thick neck, and then this waist that's just kind of... It's just a little bit off for me, and it's it's... It's kind of a bummer, but that's just, I guess that's just kind of how it goes sometimes uh, when it comes to designing these characters. What I like most about Ilawi is that she represents a body type that really isn't present anywhere else in the women of League of Legends. Like, she is the only one who has this particular body type in the entire character roster. Which has always, to me, been a point of criticism for Riot, is that they have so many characters. They have so many different character designs, but for a hell of a lot of their characters, male and female, but especially female, they tend to default to a rather narrow set of body types. Especially with the women, like the Misfortunes, the Aries, the, uh, the Sayas, the Luxes, they all tend towards the same very slender, uh, very feminine-shaped, kind of petite 
expression, which is like, there's nothing wrong with that. It's good for many purposes. But when you have a character like, for instance, Leona, who's supposed to be a big, powerful warrior in a big suit of armor, and she's supposed to play a tank in the game, this kind of body type makes a lot more sense than the one she actually has, which is virtually identical to the one that Diana has, and she's an agile assassin character. So it's like, this is available. Like, this is an option. You clearly know how to do it, and it's a little bit annoying that Laoi is the only one for whom they have bothered to try that particular physical expression. But that's more a criticism of the rest of the game. It's not so much a criticism of Ilawi, really. Ilawi herself is a good character design. Now, mostly, um, she's a very simple character design. There really isn't a lot going on with her. Um, <clears throat> there, isn't, there isn't a lot to talk about when it comes to her costume. It's just kind of a basic, she looks vaguely fantasy-ish costume with a breastplate and some robe stuff. But there's nothing really there that ties her visually to her religious role. There's really no indication of like being a priestess or being some kind of ceremonial role or anything. She looks like a warrior, which is what she is, I suppose. But it might have been nice to incorporate a few more elements of this kind of of the formal, the ritualized, that we generally tend to associate with various types of religions. That that might have been nice to see in there. Um, because as it stands, most of her character design is kind of understated and generic. There really isn't a lot going on with her costume. The most interesting part of her character design, really, is the tattoos and the decals that she's essentially got going on on her body. Now, to me, they remind me of the kind of things you see on Pacific Islanders, or in Pacific Islander culture, rather. Maori, um, perhaps uh, American Samoans, uh, various indigenous peoples from perhaps the New Zealands. Ge general sense of, of that Pacific culture seems to be represented there. Now, I'm not an expert of those cultures, so for me, that's just the impression that I get. I don't know if that's actually true. And then you've got some symbology that's tied more to something that looks vaguely South American with the jewelry and, you know, the brace that she's wearing around her neck and her gloves and stuff, that to me carries some hints, some elements of indigenous culture from South America, uh, especially the Maya and the Aztec. The same thing goes for the giant orb that she carries around, like the big, the big tentacle orb uh, that she holds around. That seems to be taking some visual inspiration from those cultures, <clears throat> which is an interesting mix. Like, I've, I've, oh, I've felt for a long time that Riot could incorporate a lot more... Um, you know, visual signifiers from various First Nations around the world. Like, Africa is vastly underexplored in League of Legends. There is, it's a huge continent. It has so many cultures. It has so many mythologies, so many aesthetics that they could pull from that might be kind of nice. So, again, Ilawi is a breath of fresh air in that regard. And she, she pulls from some cultures, from some lores and some backgrounds that a lot of other characters in League of Legends haven't really touched yet. And that makes her unique. But yeah, outside of that, I guess there really isn't that much to say about Ilawi. Like, compare... When, when you look at warrior character designs, especially for women, it is often useful to use actual athletes, like people who, are gen who genuinely live a life of hard physical exertion as your models for the kind of body types, for the kind of character designs that you create, instead of using the history of fantasy designs in character design, which tends more towards the bikini babe clinging onto Conan's leg, you know, on the front page of the pulp comic that you buy for a quarter at the newsstand back in the 1940s. Like, we, a lot of fantasy art kind of gets stuck there. A lot of um, superhero comics kind of get stuck in that idea, like the slender, the gymnastic ideal of strength. Ra 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 <clears throat> swallowed my word there, rather than one that's based on actual physical, you know, imposing power. And this is not like a thing about, oh, characters aren't allowed to be sexy anymore, because, well, first of all, lots of people find Yalawi sexy, I can tell you this from experience having met them. Um, and second of all, it's not really about whether the character is allowed to be attractive, and it's not really about whether the character is allowed to be feminine. It's about how do you express the kind of thing that drives her, because Ilawi, her physicality, her character design, everything about her is a perfect expression of the ideals by which she lives her life. That, that, that idea that she's the gatekeeper for the rest of humanity. She's the test that everybody must overcome in order to be holy in the eyes of her god. In order to be living good lives, you have to be able to deal with the test that Ilawi sets you. She's the barrier, she's the wall between you and a good life. She's the challenge, right? 
And so Ilawi's physicality serves that purpose. Whereas, you know, if you have a character who doesn't really, their physicality doesn't really live up to the kind of ideal that they're supposed to live, that can be a weakness in the character design, depending on the genre, of course. Anyway, I think I'm going in circles a little bit, so let's call this one here. If you have enjoyed this video, you should feel extremely free to subscribe to the channel. I, I, I'd be very grateful. You can also uh, like the video or comment down below if you are so inclined. And... If you happen to have like a dollar that you don't need, like that's just kind of, it's just kind of lying there. It's just kind of squatting. It's just sitting there watching Netflix all day, not really contributing anything to the household. Well, you can send that dollar over to me and I'm going to give it a proper education in what it means to be spent on rent and buying food and stuff. And, you know, we'll take good care of it and we'll give you frequent updates. Um, and it's going to live on a farm and it's going to be lovely and you know, it's going to be happy for its re for the rest of its days and you don't have to worry about it anymore. That kind of got away from me a little bit. Um, if you uh, didn't like this video, that is, of course, also fair enough. And if you don't want to support the Patreon, if you don't want to, if you don't have the money for that kind of thing, of course, that's completely okay. I don't want anyone to feel bad about that. Sometimes I get messages from people who apologize for not supporting the Patreon, and it's like, no, 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 it, it's fine, like, anyone who gives a dollar is giving more than I could possibly ask for, it's it's a gift, I'm very grateful, but don't ever feel bad for it, anyway, uh, if you didn't like the video, there's a dislike button down below that you can click, but I should warn you that the dislike button has been possessed by some kind of elder god, and I'm not really sure what the hell is going on, but if you click on it, there's like a non-zero chance that it's gonna burst into just this giant mess of tentacles, and it's gonna... it... do... stuff... And unless you're super into that kind of thing, and I'm not judging, then, you know, just be careful before you click it, because there's a non-zero chance of, like, Cthulhu shit going on. Thank you very much for watching.